I'm delighted to be on here on stage uh, to be joined by Jeremy Fleming, the director of GCHQ, who has over 25 years' experience in national security and intelligence. As director of GCHQ, he's overseen the organisation's response to the 2017 terror attacks in the UK, the release of WannaCry and the use of a nerve agent in Salisbury and Amesbury in 2018, among many other uh, challenges he's had to tackle. I'm also joined here by Ben Hudson, Chief Technology Officer at BAE Systems, who's responsible for reinforcing and enhancing his company's position as a technology leader in defence. We're also joined by General Sir Patrick Sanders, who's Commander of Strategic Command, which leads in the cyber domain for UK defence. He's a senior British Army officer and has commanded at Company Battalion, Brigade and Divisional Welcome, uh, Divisional Level. And my final welcome is for Gus McGregor Miller, the General Manager for Global Defence and Intelligence at Microsoft Worldwide Public Sector. Gus has also had a career in the British Army and served in the Royal Artillery, supporting training and operations globally. Welcome to you all. I have a question for all of you. Um, and in a sense, I was going to probably ask uh, Sir Patrick if you might take it first. What constitutes full spectrum capability for our defence and our security forces today, would you say, and over the next decade? Thanks, Samira. Um, so I think that I would I'd start by, uh, if you're going to define full spectrum, it's first of all, it's got to be able to deal with both above the threshold, so war fighting in the traditional sense, uh, NATO Article 5 type operations, but increasingly, uh, and more importantly, it needs to be able to operate and compete more effectively below the threshold of warfare. I think secondly, um, full spectrum means that we've got to be uh, uh, an information age, we've got to retain information age capabilities rather than purely industrial. And if you like, if you were to characterize uh, the British defense forces that we have today, the armed forces we have today, uh, you would describe them as, as joint and fit for industrial age warfare, but not yet integrated and fit for information age warfare. I think the third element would be that we've got to place a premium on integration. I mean, the clue is in the title when it comes to the integrated review, and that means being integrated more effectively cross government and with partners across government, but also with allies, and for my purposes, across the five operational domains, the three traditional physical ones, and then space and cyber as well. I think full spectrum means being able to deal with threats at home and away. The idea that we're only going to play away fixtures, I think, is for the birds. We're under direct threat in, in, in the UK, certainly in the cyber domain, and also to a greater extent in the maritime and the air domain. I think it means being able to take on a range of tasks that, that perhaps go beyond the traditional capabilities where we think about defence. And by that, I suppose I mean resilience in the UK. But I also think this means harnessing the full spectrum of society in a way that, for example, the Swedes do, and Dr. Elizabeth Braw talks about this very compellingly, this notion of defence and security being a national enterprise, about it being total defence, about drawing on all of the capabilities and the richness of society. In the armed forces, that means um, relying increasingly on reserves and auxiliaries, but also partnering with industry and academia. But it's taking that full spectrum of society so that we are as diverse as the country is. We're drawing on the very best talent um, and uh, unable to exploit that. I'll stop there. Thank you. No, fantastic to have set things out so clearly. Can I ask um, Jeremy Fleming next uh, for your same question to you? Well, I think the general has covered a very broad spectrum there. Let me try and uh, bring some examples uh, to, to uh, bring that to life. Um, full, full spectrum depends on the range of threats you're trying to counter. And so full spectrum at the point at which this great naval dockyard was first used meant a very different thing to uh, that that we're dealing with today. And of course the major difference about today is the interconnectivity of the world. It's the pervasiveness of technology. It's the speed at which information flows. It's the way in which we all relate as society. So full spectrum has come to mean a very different thing. And I think all of our response to COVID is, uh, is, a, is a really good example of what that really means. So defence has brought to bear a whole range of, of capability in, in the nation's response to uh, COVID, and extremely impressive uh, too. But it's also been about bringing those capabilities, bringing intelligence capabilities, bringing industrial capabilities to bear on data. 
It's been about defending the nation's vaccine approach in a different way. It's been putting a cybersecurity wrapper around the health system. It's been uh, uh, competing, contesting cyber criminals who are, exceeding, who are, who are uh, trying to exploit the crisis. And indeed, it's been about contesting those states who are seeking either to gain their own strategic advantage or access to the technologies. So I think full spectrum means something very different today. It is much more than physical, it's virtual and it's societal. Um, well, let's get some interesting perspectives on this as well. Ben Hudson, from your point of view, how would you describe a full spectrum capability? Thanks, uh, Samar. A really interesting uh, uh, topic, I think. We've been casting our minds this year into really past 2030 and looking at what the battlefield is in 2035 and beyond. And really uh, interesting what Paul said in the, in the uh, preceding um, uh, session regarding FICINT uh, and very much thinking fictionally what that could be. Um, without going across the full spectrum, there's three key drivers that uh, are, are of significant interest to us as we think of how we'll partner with our customers to create competitive advantage for them on that battlefield of 2030 and beyond. Space is the new high ground. Um, it is the ultimate high ground. It plays across uh, all domains, land, air, sea, subsea and cyber. Um, uh, we've seen a democratisation of space in recent years. Launch costs have fallen to 95% of what they were 20 years ago. And, and what was on a 500 kilo satellite now exists on a 50 kilo satellite. We're seeing an exponential growth on the commercial uh, side. We saw SpaceX in the last month launch uh, more than 160 satellites into orbit. This is happening. This is going to be exponential. And the combination of, of space as that ultimate high ground and how it plays with assets and platforms like this at the heart of, of, of the Alliance, I think, is, is really interesting. And, and without going too much more into that, that's a, a key change, uh, uh, driver of change we'll see across full spectrum. Um, autonomy. The next revolution in warfare is potentially autonomy and what that means. There's a big question mark about the rules-based battlefield and how autonomy plays into that. Can you just define what do you mean by autonomy in this context? So autonom autonomous systems. The, the next revolution I think we'll see is by 2035, real manned, unmanned teaming, whether that's an air platform with an offboard unmanned platform, whether that's ships like this with unmanned uh, uh, systems operating with them to distribute sensors on the battlefield, even into the... Uh, 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 the cyber uh, sphere and, and humans working with all, uh, AI type algorithms. So the speed of battle is going to increase, autonomy is part of it. We've got some interesting ethical dilemmas to face on, on, uh, on the rules based battlefield and, and what that means. And then the last big piece that we've been looking at is, is high speed weapons, hypersonics. Speed is the new stealth, um, both from a defensive and an offensive perspective. And when we tie space autonomous systems, manned and unmanned teaming, and high-speed weapons together, you create some really interesting opportunities that will bring competitive advantage to, to NATO on that battlefield of the future. So, so they're just some of the key themes we're thinking about right now in the, across the, the spectrum of, of operations. Thank you for raising and also to remind people who might have missed it, we had a hypersonics uh, session yesterday and we have a specific panel later today on space. Um, Gus McGregor-Miller, your thoughts on uh, the same issue, please. Samira, good uh, afternoon uh, from, me, uh, from Germany. Um, I'll keep it short and I'll build for, off uh, of what was said both by uh, General Sir Patrick, uh, but also what Lord uh, said well yesterday. This has to be integrated and allied by design. So as we build these strategic partnerships between vendors, um, such as say, uh, my colleague on, the, uh, on stage, um, to design, develop and deploy these uh, commercial and military grade uh, uh, platforms, we should be thinking about it from digital from the start. Today, more or less, digital is bolted on afterwards as an, as an afterthought to either the maintenance, repair and overhaul or, or how these are, are run and operated. So as we go forward and thinking uh, um, about 2030, then I think it needs to be, as they said yesterday, integrated and allied by design. Thank you. Um, I have a question specifically now um, for you, Jeremy Fleming. You already mentioned the pandemic. I mean, the world right now, it's hard every time it happens, but to think that 
the range of threats right now that we find ourselves facing on multiple fronts does seem quite remarkable and to some extent by the general public at least unpredicted with the pandemic escalating global tensions and threats can i ask a very simple very journalistic question what keeps you awake at night <laughs> oh it's a, it's a question i'm often asked and my first rather trite answer is i sleep very well at night but i think it is true to say that uh, we do face a vast range of uh, threats uh, i'm confident that with the alliances we have the partnerships we have, the brilliant brains, the mix of minds we have in our, uh, in our country and with our partners and uh, particularly here with the US, that we are equal to those challenges. If, if, I, if I have a concern, it's that we are rapid enough in organizing ourselves to face them. Uh, the fundamental importance of events like this is that we get to expose those challenges. We get to challenge ourselves in our response and how we should organize ourselves uh, to uh, deliver against them. So I, I'm, I'm not worried that we can uh, respond. I think we have the capabilities to respond. But I, I, do, I do worry that we are coming together quickly enough to produce the, the institutions, the global alliances that are going to uh, take on the mantle from the Bretton Woods system and really see us into this digital and technology age. My next question I'm going to put to you all, but I want to start by asking uh, General um, Sir Patrick. You talked about how much development there has been, and in a sense, we're at that stage where traditional armed services and then the sort of cyber capabilities have both developed massively, but there's still an issue about sort of integration. To stay ahead of our adversaries, um, you know, thinking about in innovative solutions that are needed, I wonder what you think the next generation of defence is going to look like. Um, if I could predict that, that accurately, then I wouldn't be sitting here wearing a uniform. I'd be earning um, vast fortunes being a super predictor. But I'll give it a go. I, I think I'd start, Samira, with what doesn't change. Um, and there's a lot you could describe. But um, first off, we talk um, about the character of warfare and the nature of warfare. The character being the representation of the threats and the capabilities and the tactics that you see at any given moment in time. But the nature is enduring. It doesn't change. And it's visceral. It's violent. It's always about people. But it's always about politics. So I don't think that is going to change, although there is an interesting question about whether autonomy begins to introduce a fundamental change into the nature of warfare. I also think, certainly for, from our perspective, it always will be and must be allied. So the previous point about being allied by design is crucial. And there's always going to be an element of hard power where it doesn't matter how capable you are in space or in cyberspace or you're good at you are at manipulating data. If someone comes at you with a machete, you've got to be able to deal with that. There's always a way of getting around technology. Um, I think the other thing that doesn't change is what our fundamental purpose is, which is ultimately to deter threats to the UK and to our allies to protect, but also increasingly to be able to compete. So when I think about this, I, I try to think of it, it's very tempting to rush towards technology. But I think if you think of it in terms of people, process and technology, you get a slightly broader answer. And the first thing that I think will have to change um, is, is, our, is our people, not that we don't have very, very good people working for us now, but the, the range of tasks that we're going to give them, it goes back to my point about being um, full spectrum, about drawing on the full talents of society. So in an information age, we're going to require people with different skills, and we're organisationally not necessarily going to be structured in a purely bottom-fed way. The processes matter because if we're going to shift to... Um, competing all the time and using all of the levers of government in a very integrated way, in the way that Mark said, well, I'm sure would have set out yesterday, then you've got to make sure that the government processes, the way that government exercises and pulls on those levers, matches the agility or outpaces the agility of what our opponents are doing. But if you're asking me about what capabilities and what technology we can exploit, I mean, the short answer, if I was to leave you with one word, it would be it's all about data, the curation of data, our ability to transmit and network data, and crucially, our ability to exploit it. So there's something about the future being characterized by hyperconnectivity, where you, we've got to move military structures from being hierarchical to a hive mind. Um, this, there's always going to be something about understanding, making sure that you can measure, you can track, you can predict the threats. 
And what's interesting is that um, uh, the way that we're going to see that is increasingly going to be with what we call open source information rather than the very highly classified information that we've tended to associate with intelligence broadly, particularly defense intelligence. Thank you. I think there's another characteristic is that we're going to need to be, for all the reasons you heard talked about earlier on, much more dispersed and disaggregated, because if you if you mass, you become extraordinarily vulnerable. So the ability to mass effects, but not platforms, to use different vectors to achieve effects in multiple domains is going to characterize the future. And I'll leave you with one. The last one is that it's going to have to be sustainable, not simply because we're trying to match government targets or UN targets, but because for military purposes, we're simply not going to have access to the sources of power, of oil, of fuel. So the sustainability of, uh, of, of defence um, is as important to defence as it is to, to the climate and to the country. Fantastic. Thank you. So I'm going to come to you next, Gus. Uh, what do you see the next generation of defence looking like and what capabilities will we see in that decade? Samir, I'll pick up on the, uh, what the uh, uh, General Sir Patrick just introduced, which was looking backwards at the, at the nature of, of conflict. I'm going to go that far back. Innovation was historically driven out of the beltway and, and driven out of, of the military um, a, uh, in, in, the, in the past few decades. That's moved now. And it first of all moved into Silicon Valley, you might argue, but it's now moved away from that. So. Microsoft might spend some 17 billion on, on R&D and, and it might support that dispersal of, a, um, of data and that transmission of, a, um, of data for, for military entities. That's fine and good. But tech firms' investment in quantum AI autonomy, space, cyber, those small tech firms is going to outstrip what is on the defense agenda. So if you're going to do it in a sustainable manner, then that next generation of defence needs to tap into this. And in the UK, I think it was two years ago, three years ago, the J-Hub was uh, created. And that J-Hub is one manner in which you can start to tap in to those smaller uh, uh, companies. And you don't rely on the likes of Microsoft, the British Aerospace, um, Raytheon, who've all been a, a part of the, uh, the conference this week. And I think you'll also see convergence so if I, I think about convergence, you know, I'm very excited that we're um, on the ship today. You know, I have a personal uh, a connection with the uh, with the signing of the uh, um, the uh, the original uh, uh, charter. Uh, my father um, he was a, a young naval lieutenant um, on HMS Churchill, um, and the only time that the uh, prime minister actually visited uh, that ship that bore his name was on returning from uh, uh, signing uh, the uh, the charter in the uh, um, in 41 so you know personally for me as well as professionally it, it's great to be involved but if we go back to convergence we are working with spacex we announced it yesterday um, as as a company why because we believe that having high speed low latency satellite broadband and then you add into it a modular data center. It's the best use that I've seen in a 40 foot container in a long time that allows us to bring that sort of technology very quickly uh, onto the battlefield and for the use by US or UK. Thank you. Um, Jeremy Fleming. So, so just very briefly, I think we, we are increasingly using resilience in the same breath as defense. And uh, that's a really important thing for us all to get our heads around. It implies a, a more societal-wide view of it. Uh, and of course, that has really been noticeable to us over the, over the last year. But I think that means then that we've got to be much more strategic about where that resilience is coming from. So defence becomes how good are we at looking after our emerging technologies? Uh, how joined up are we in our, with our industrial strategies? Uh, how are we working with our allies to make sure that our, our Western democratic liberal mindset is reflected in standards for technology in the future? It becomes, it becomes I think, a very different question that is you know, far, far broader than the ones we've been used to dealing with in the past. Thank you. And Ben Hudson, your thoughts on this? Really quickly, just to pick up on, uh, on something General Sir Patrick said about data. Uh, if we think about some of those future capabilities, space, hypersonics, in, uh, integrated ISR constellations globally, the data that is going to, to engulf our forces in the future is enormous. We talk about lakes of data or data lakes. I think that undersells the problem. Um, it's oceans of data. 
AI plays a really important part of that, of, of fusing data, understanding it, and giving our forces potentially the, the ability to act quicker and faster. Getting inside a, a, an adversary's uh, a decision cycle is vital, and, and that's the fusing of, of this data. But if we don't get hold of that problem early, uh, we are going to be swimming in an ocean of data, not knowing what to do with it. So. And one of the challenges uh, with the growing importance of, of, um, of data in this whole picture is the reliance on a kind of close partnership between industry, between government, between intelligence services and the armed services. And there is, to some extent, certainly in the public eye, sometimes a tension or fears about conflicts of interest. So I wanted to ask all of you, perhaps starting with Gus, you know, it's obviously important to have this kind of close partnership. Could you give some insight into how it can be made to work positively as a collaborative environment? And do you have any examples of successes that you can share with us? Certainly. So I think over the next decade, what we'll see is this play out where your classic defence primes will be forming strategic partnerships with, with new uh, and new players. It might be hyperscale cloud providers like ourselves. It might be others. Yeah. Um, and they're going to be looking to generate end to end mission capability. I might refer to it as finding mission pathfinders that we want to uh, um, that we want to test out. We also need to make sure that the startups take advantage of the same technology. I mentioned it in, uh, in my previous answer. But key to unlocking that ecosystem, and it's been raised by uh, uh, several of the, uh, uh, the speakers in, in the last day, uh, a day and a half, is trust. So it's no coincidence that uh, from the point of view of Microsoft, we're recruiting veterans. But we're not only recruiting veterans to build those cultural bridges and to help join the dots, but because we see the need to provide that educated a, a workforce, operators that know how to work in this space and who can have a career, perhaps like myself, um, uh, once they uh, choose to uh, uh, they need to retire. So collaboration rests on that cultural alignment. It's enabled by empathy and, and education across those parties. But uh, um, I think we're just at the beginning, I suspect, Samira. Thank you. Um, and Ben Hudson, same question to you, if you have any examples to share as well. Yeah, I think there's um, uh, some interesting ones, but, uh, but I guess what I'd say that I think is vital is creating some ecosystems. Partnerships fundamental to what we do. Um, I think we would love to see more partnership with our customers to understand what their thoughts for the future are so we can, we can help them architect the future. But it goes the other way as well. It's small to medium enterprises and right down to single individuals where we can create interesting ecosystems to create, again, competitive advantage for the battlefield. One small example I, I would cite without naming the individual, but we sponsored a PhD the last uh, a couple of years. A single individual with the research he's done has made a fundamental difference and impact on the future of undersea warfare. Um, uh, and that's really about joining the dots and really creating partnerships in two directions, customers and then out to SMEs, other primes and, and right down to individuals that, uh, that can uh, be part of the solutions. Um, uh, General, um, Sir Patrick, do you have uh, anything to add on this, on this issue of kind of collaborative working? So, I, I, I mean, we always go back, don't we, to, uh, to dire warnings, um, I think it was from Eisenhower, about the, the threat from the military industrial complex. Um, and we thought we don't clearly want to do, don't want to do is to recreate that, uh, that dynamic, that perception. That casts quite a long shadow, though, because what we have seen from um, some of the, uh, the software, the data companies that, uh, that we need to work with has been an instinctive cultural suspicion of defence and security as a set. Sector, um, and an unwillingness to either work with or share uh, IP or share capabilities with us. And we've got to overcome that obstacle um, by earning, if you like, our license to operate, but also, as Jeremy was putting it, making sure that we reflect this broader societal resilience, understanding, as the Swedes put it, that this is about total defence. Um, because... Ah... Uh. Uh, the, the very same companies that may be unwilling to share, to share their IP um, uh, with us um, is uh, uh, may unwittingly be sharing it with our adversaries because of different um, arrangements out there. If I was going to pick on you know, two things, the, the first would be that the, on, for us, for our part, from the sort of governments from the from the MOD's perspective, we need to make sure that we are we are user friendly, we are good partners, that we're encouraging. Um, a much more agile approach to acquisition. Plenty of people will have talked about it, but in the information age, we simply cannot um, apply industrial era acquisition practices to what are very, very fast moving technologies. 
and a specific example, and I won't name the company, I'm particularly interested in how we're developing a synthetic environment um, with, uh, with a company where both are benefiting. So they're bringing gaming expertise, technological expertise, understanding, and we're bringing users. And so there is shared IP, there's shared risk, and there are shared benefits and outcomes. And a model like that is really attractive. Um, Jeremy Fleming, is there a unique GCHQ angle on this? And let me add, I know I bring a sort of journalistic head, but I do think about what members of the public say to me. And there is this anxiety about the idea of perhaps only certain kinds of people are being brought in with some of this, this work and the dangers that might go with that. Well, let me, let me address three things then. First, I really like the ecosystems world, word. So we are trying to create ecosystems that bring in academia. They uh, encompass startups. They bring venture capital. Uh, they bring business expertise, and from time to time they also bring deep technical covert knowledge from GCHQ, and we have a, a whole range of accelerator programs. We're part of the, the government's National Security Strategic Innovation Fund uh, work, and we're looking to do much more of that. I, I really think there is something about ecosystems. Secondly, something about um, uh, careers. So it is the case that in, in, my, in my business we are not nearly diverse enough either to reflect the country that we're here to serve or to face the challenges that we've been talking about today. I, I think that's changing rapidly. And, and actually, we have a very um, a, 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 a picture that in, at one end around how we treat and think about cerebral div diversity has always been extremely good and world-leading. But when I'm talking about the numbers of uh, particularly people from our ethnic minority communities who are part of my business, then we're far too low. We're way off what the nat national uh, picture suggests it should be. So I'm interested in attracting a different set of minds uh, for the next generation of GCHQ. I think that goes for all of defence, uh, by the way. I think that when we get those people in, we can quickly show that we're the type of business that they can be part of and that they can make a, a difference in. And I know that the skills they bring uh, make, a, make a very rapid difference to us too. And then the third thing is just to come back to this debate we need to have around all of this. If, if, if uh, the future world is technology and data-based as we have been discussing uh, today, then we need to have a different debate uh, with our publics, with uh, our government, our parliament, but also between allies on how we use that data and what privacy really means today. And I think that's a fundamental part of the debate that we're not yet getting to. Yeah. No, well, thank you for raising it. The one other big issue I absolutely have to use the time that remains to discuss with you, um, Jeremy Fleming, is offensive cyber capabilities. Um, the UK and the US, uh, well, yesterday we learnt details about how they'd uncovered um, a Russian plan to hack the Tokyo Olympics. Um, the use of offensive cyber capabilities is something that the UK and the US have both declared against Islamic State. Can you give us a bit of an insight into why cyber power and how important cyber power is to protecting uh, the UK and what constitutes offensive cyber capabilities as part of our defence? Given the pervasiveness of technology and of cyber, uh, we, uh, over a year ago now, um, in, a, in a public speech, set out a concept that we called cyber power. And uh, what we said was that for a, for a nation to prosper, for its citizens to be economically prosperous and safe, then it needed to be world class at defending its digital homeland, the cybersecurity mission. Uh, it needed to be with partners uh, shaping the rules for cyberspace in that Western democratic liberal way in accordance with the rule of law that we've talked about. And it needed in extremis to have the ability to contest cyber in cyberspace, uh, to compete um, occasionally to use it in a military construct, a warlike construct where destruction would result. And that sense of thinking about cyber power across all of those domains, I think, is something that has gained quite a lot of currency. There's quite a lot of academic uh, thinking around it. Uh, you focused on one element of it, of it. I always start from the defensive mm. domain. If, you don't, if you're not capable of securing your digital homeland, then you can't do any of the rest. And here in the UK, we've set up the National uh, Cyber Security Centre, which I think is, is world leading in doing that, uh, and very close partnerships with lots of um, the US government uh, too. 
Offensive cyber itself is a term. I mean, it's, it's a term. I, I, I think if we were writing the term or inventing the term today, we probably would um, would, would try and uh, call it something different. Offensive would is quite. Something, yes, it? It, well, it would be cyber operations is yeah. how I how I think about it, and uh, it, it is uh, using our capabilities in a full spectrum way to try and compete, contest, and occasionally uh, destruct in in cyberspace. Um, both the UK and the US have declared capabilities in this regard. NATO is thinking very seriously about how to integrate um, uh, those capabilities. And some things are, I think, absolutely fundamental for me. The, the first is that these capabilities are deployed in accordance with the international rule of law. Full stop. Really, really important to say that um, up front. Uh, the, the, sec the second thing to say is that, that there, is no, uh, there are very few magic big red buttons that you press that have that sort of effect. Uh, offensive cyber is the tip of a big intelligence, security, and defense partnership. Um, in my organization, we say 90% of those cyber operations comes from brilliant intelligence about your adversary, about the environment you're trying to contest, about the impact that you need to have. And you have, tr you have true um, uh, operational cyber impact if you are able to enable that whole spectrum Can you of give cyber us an example of how you've deployed operationally? Yeah, so we've, um, uh, so one example I, we've put in the, in the public domain so far, and that's in the uh, campaign that we had, uh, joined up with across the military and intelligence world in the UK, but also particularly with our US partners across the military and intelligence world that countered um, Daesh's uh, information operations and their cyber operations. Uh, and that's something that we have talked about publicly because I think it's a really good example of what one end um, uh, getting in and amongst their media and making it difficult for them to promulgate it, making it difficult for them to uh, produce it. On the other hand, working very closely with deployed military operations so that the impact of those operations was also in the same space. And, and, and those sorts of end-to-end -end, um, operations, there's no, there's no blueprint for these. This is... This is new space. We're developing new doctrine uh, to, uh, to, 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 to do this. You, you've called out the Olympics um, example from yesterday. Mm. Um, I mean, again, that, was a, uh, that involved a number of allies in, in uh, doing that. And I think what it's saying to our adversaries are that if, if you seek to use cyberspace as a, as a place where you are going to try and destroy yourself or promote your values or try and degrade our interests, then we will be there to compete against you. And so there's a, a deterrence effect from the sort of activity, sorry, that, uh, that uh, you saw yesterday. Uh, where we are putting the information out there so that industry can understand where the threats are coming from and develop their products and their protections alongside it. But also so that our citizens and our allies um, understand that we are active in this space. Thank you. Um, and I don't know if uh, Sir Patrick is there on the line. I'm going to try it. If you are, is there anything you wanted to add for your insights into how um, we are kind of countering uh, cyber operations from the likes of North Korea, Russia and Iran? Guessing not. Um, so kind of final word to our other panellists then. I don't know how how cyber um, warfare is something that you incorporate into your thinking corporately. Um, I don't know if you want to take that first, um, Ben, and then um, Gus. Thanks, Samira. Um, I mean, cyber is one of the acknowledged domains uh, now and, and for the future. The data problem we, we got is there, it's real. Um, we have a strong partnership with the uh, a range of government organisations here in the UK and, uh, and across NATO, particularly on, on, the, on the defensive side of of cyber, but when we think about platforms and that of the future, they have to be cyber hardened. They have to be uh, able to be defended from some of these threats that, that you've talked about. So it, it is fundamental to our thinking. We've got Sir Patrick back. If you could be relatively brief, Sir Patrick, just again an insight from your experience into how um, we are tackling kind of offensive cyber operations by the likes of North Korea, Russia, and Iran. So. Um, uh I wouldn't say anything here that Jeremy wouldn't say because we work in complete partnership um, uh, on, on this. And I'm not going to talk about um, specific uh, operations that we're doing. I think what I would say is, first of all, um, with, a, with a half smile on my face, Jeremy and I have long discussions about whether he, in cyber operations or offensive cyber. And we come at this from, from, I think, a healthy point of difference. From my perspective, NATO declares offensive capabilities, but it uses them in a defensive way. Uh, which is why I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with the term, but, but, but 
But Jeremy is right, because these are essentially simply cyber operations, and there's a defensive and an offensive component to them. The second point I'd make is that, you know, in this, you know, I was talking earlier on about how the character of warfare has changed and how our adversaries are effectively um, and progressively weakening and undermining us and testing us all the time below the threshold. And of course, an awful lot of that plays out in, in cyberspace. So this is being done to us all the time. If you need to, if you want to deter both above the threshold, but crucially deter, you have to be actively engaged in cyberspace. And a very big component of that, just to really re-emphasize what Jeremy is saying, is about protecting your networks, about protecting um, the UK, protecting, for my purposes, defense. Um, but you've got, if you're going to deter, you've also got to be able to not only have, but also show so that you've got, you can demonstrate you've got the credibility and capability to, uh, to counter and to do uh, uh, harm to others. And that involves a, a very active process of being engaged forward all the time in cyberspace. Sir Patrick, thank you. And a very brief final word to Gus on this issue. We'd love to hear what the Microsoft view is on cyber warfare. Well, we're not actively engaged in offensive cyber operations, say, uh, uh, Samira, but we do focus on defence with both the US and the UK. And you'll hear Brad talk a little bit about that uh, in, in the next session. And you'll have seen the report uh, uh, recently about the, uh, the prevention of the bot attack on, on the US elections. The last thing that we do, we're the only tech firm that publish a digital defence report. We name names. Um, uh, for the, the non-state actors uh, and the countries that are involved in this. And I recommend it as a, a reading for, for folks after the, uh, after the conference. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd particularly like to express my thanks for the level of insight they were able to give, given, of course, all the limitations on what you can share with us. So thank you so much for being here for that fascinating panel discussion.